Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call the City of Kenmore Planning Commission meeting to order for February 15th, 2022. Um, we have several things tonight, including a panel, which we're all looking forward to, and we'll talk about that in a little moment. So first is public comments for three minutes. Uh, comment limit applies. Do we have anyone that wishes to speak? Please raise your hand so Rita can yes. put you on. We, I see a couple hands going up. I'm going to promote you to panelist and then you can unmute your mic and start your comment. You will have three minutes. Looks like our first one is Stacy V. Hi, Stacy Valenzuela, Kenmore. It is important to put forward the actions to keep our residents sheltered and lower the cost burden of our residents. We are already in desperate need. Then the pandemic hit. Many of our residents are on fixed income, currently out of work, on cut hours or one step away from homelessness. The cost of inflation is a huge burden on our most vulnerable. Many residents will be evicted in the upcoming months. The King County Affordable Housing Task Force reported in 2019 projected that our county alone would need 28,000 additional low affordable housing units now, 156,000 in five years and 244,000 in the next 20 years. By bonus and market rate units that Arch and most developers build sit empty for months. Others are filled temporarily, like much housing with tenants that are one bill, one injury, one paycheck from being evicted. And many times four to five wage earners are sharing a one bedroom apartment. Many minimum wage workers are living in tents at Camp Unity and many others reside in their cars. We keep hearing that no one should be living cost burden, spending over 30% on their income on housing. Our city leaders, staff and developers need to support the density and rental rates to increase the desperately needed low income and extremely low affordable housing. We need you to support organizations that support and build real affordable housing in our community. We need you to require more of the developers to meet these needs and build at least 25 to 30% of their units at the very low and extremely low affordable housing rates or 30% AMI to qualify for permits, incentives and tax exemptions. We need you to apply for grant money and to support building the low and very low income housing units that these complexes or developments need. We need our leaders in Kenmore and developers to bring the creativeness forward building very low and extremely low affordable housing units in our TOD area. Together, you can make a huge difference and make Kenmore's TOD the area of mixed affordable housing that we all can celebrate. Please come forward and do this. It would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Tracy. And now, um, Rita, who would be our next person for a three-minute comment? Uh, next, we have John Hendrickson. If you give me just one moment, let me promote to panelist. There we go. Uh, John, you can go ahead and unmute. And when you begin to speak, I'll start your three minutes. Okay, can you guys hear me now? Yes, yes we, can. we can. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you for coming. All right. You know, I, were, I was on the council for eight years and the, the only way I see housing working for the people that really need it is that we have to house them. But I think, you know, just like we have the, the boats down at the marina in Kenmore, where they can put them on a, on a big forklift and they can stack those boats five high. I think we need containers. They're making them down in California, housing units that you could and build a structure for them to go into. And the people would never have to move. If they need to go somewhere else, we can take the container out and move it to another spot that has the same facility, plug them in, 
and hook up the water, hook up the sewer, hook up the electric. How much does that cost compared to what we're doing now? Uh, what we're doing now, I if you wanna look at TOD and affordable housing at Kenmore Village, look at the history. We, the developer wouldn't build unless we had affordable at a rate of 85% median income. That means the rate to qualify would be around 1800 a month to 2000 a month. And the actual market rate was 1400. So there really was no affordable housing, but because they complied with that, we gave them a tax break of for over 10 years of $12 million. So, you know, you need to get real you know, this country was really founded on, and it's a great success story because we are founded on principles of reason, scientific method, goodwill, human decency, honesty, and integrity. How are you gonna pay the workers that do all this work and make it that we can house all these people without having some kind of, of you know, mass production like we have in the car industry? How can you do it? Look at what we're doing. Look at how much it costs. So, I mean, I sent you, I sent Debbie Bent the lumber summary report for the last 12 months. I'm hoping that you have it. Back in, I got it from Plywood Supply. It tells you how much it costs to build a 2,700 square foot home. Before COVID, it was around 13,000 in January and we go and it ended up going up in 2020 to 28,000. If you remember in 2021 in May, Plywood at Home Depot went from 17 bucks up to $95. And you'll see in this report that I gave you guys that the cost for a 2,700 square foot house went up to 42, 43,000. But by August, it was back down to under 16,000. Where else are you gonna go in the world and you can get the lumber for a 2,700 square foot home for, for $15,000? And how much, so, where can you go to get hardwood floors for 350 to six bucks a foot? Oak hardwood floors with aluminum oxide coating. How about uh, Mr. Hendrickson? Stoves, everything. Mr. How Hendrickson? How are you going to make that work? Thank Please. you. That is your three minute time. Please deal with reality. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, John, for coming tonight. And who's up next, Rita? If you want to just give it a second, I don't see any other hands right now. So if anybody would like to give public comment, please use the raise hand feature at the bottom of the screen. We'll give everybody just a second. I see um, Victoria Grayland. If you give me just a moment, I will promote you to panelist. Ms. Graylin, you can go ahead and unmute. And... Can you hear me now? Yes, yes we, can. we can. Thank you. I was recently made aware that the Planning Commission was considering a land acknowledgement, um, I, uh, not following the city's city councils. Um, if you look at the Duwamish tribes website, they talk about land acknowledgement and they say that What's most important is to be sincere. And I think that's really true. I don't think the city council's land acknowledgement, especially read by David Baker, it, does, it never seems sincere to me. I've been collecting land acknowledgements from various educational institutes, institutions and uh, from various museums. I'd be happy to share them with you. Also on the, on the board of a, a native organization here in Seattle called Makani. I can share our land acknowledgement and the collected land acknowledgements of our staff. And I'm also on uh, an employee research resource group at AT&T, the Intertribal Council of AT&T Employees. And I have asked, reached out to our, our chair of that uh, council and asked her for that land acknowledgement. I can share all of those with you if you have a loss of words. Uh, the words are very important and you can, you can look away at all these different things I've collected. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Victoria. 
and Rita, do we have anyone else with a raised hand? I see no more hands raised at this time. Okay, if someone just gets in the next couple of minutes, just let us know. Otherwise, okay. we're, otherwise we're gonna move on to uh, the approval of minutes. Is there any discussion or objections to anything that's in the uh, minutes of uh, February 1st, 2022? Hearing none, uh, then we will adopt those minutes unless there's an objection. Consider them adopted. So our next item is the TOD panel discussion. I'd like to recognize that the staff has done a great job of putting this together. And there are three attachments, the panelist questions, and they were given to us on time. Thank you very much, Lori and Debbie. And, um, and then there are the attachment two is the TOD regulations, and then the TOD affordable housing regulations as, as in, that are um, all of the three attachments. So I will, um, with no objection, I will give it to Lori and Debbie to introduce our panel. Thank you very much, each of the panel members for taking the time of your evening and away from your families to come and, and, and discuss uh, the issues that are very important to us. Great. So good evening, Chair Thompson and members of the Planning Commission. Uh, Chair Thompson gave a good introduction to tonight's panel. But as we prepare to amend our TOD, Transit Oriented Development uh, Regulations, we thought it would be a good idea to hear from proponents um, of TOD and get some perspectives that might make uh, potential uh, development more possible and uh, eliminate roadblocks to that development. So the city adopted the TOD regulations in 2015 and we have not had a TOD project built in that time. It was created as what's called an overlay zone. In other words, it wasn't a required zoning, it was an optional zoning. So a person could uh, choose to develop under the TOD rules, or they could choose to use the underlying zoning, which is uh, ranges from multifamily to commercial. The TOD allows a much higher uh, residential density, up to 150 dwelling units per acre, but it also comes with uh, affordable housing requirements. Up to 10% of the units um, must be affordable to lower income individuals. With the arrival of bus rapid transit or BRT in 2026, it seemed an appropriate time to look at the TOD rules, particularly since we were looking at the land use element of the comprehensive plan, the land use chapter. And so um, we hope that tonight's panel will give you some insights into uh, those who have tried who, or who are interested in trying to do uh, TOD in Kenmore. So I'm going to introduce uh, the panelists just by name and organization. And then the very first question we're going to ask them, they'll be able to provide more detail about uh, their background and why uh, they are interested in TOD in Kenmore. And so the panelists are Juan Kalif with Sound Transit, Jenkins Chan with JK Chan Development, now also with Sue Development, uh, Alan Dotterman with TWG Development, Sarah Lovell with King County Metro, and Kevin Merriman with Main Street Property Group. We may have another panelist, Imad Baba from IHB Architects joining us, um, but I am not certain that he will be able to be here this evening. So the format of tonight, uh, you all have the questions. And so we anticipate uh, some of the questions are around Robin where we'll ask all panelists, others will ask uh, panelists just to contribute if they wish to. And we anticipate that it might take about an hour and a half to go through the eight questions. Uh, given that, then we would turn to the Planning Commission for questions and follow-up discussion. Members of the audience at this point won't be able to participate asking questions or uh, contributing to the discussion. Um, if there are folks who wish to comment, you can either submit your comments to the Planning Commission in care of Rita Moreno and her name and email address are on tonight's agenda. 
or you can come to the Planning Commission meeting on March 1st at seven o'clock and speak under public comment. Anyway, we welcome your input as well. So with that, I am going to start with the first question. This is a round robin question and we'll just go uh, alphabetically first time around. So the first question is, why don't you tell us about your background and experience with TOD, especially in Kenmore, you can introduce yourself. So Juan. Oh, we can't hear you. Still can't hear you. Um, why, Juan, while you work on that, why don't I ask Jenkins? And Everyone. by the way, I've asked all panelists if I can call them by their first names and they all agreed, so. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so I've always been in actually a single family development as my primary career, uh, residential development, um, but only recently I have transitioned to multifamily with Sioux development and some high rise towers that we developed and built in Seattle and Bellevue. But um, with my, with JK Chan development, uh, it was my own firm I'd started in 2017. And so I specifically had a parcel I had purchased um, right on the city uh, border with Bothell on 83rd and um, ended up developing it as a 12 unit townhome. But for the first year, we actually actually delayed construction and startup construction despite having permit approval to look at um, a potential 60 unit apartment building using the TOD overlay. So um, we looked at that uh, and it just didn't quite work um, from, uh, from several perspectives, uh, mostly market perspectives at that point. Uh, but I uh, really enjoyed working with the city of Kenmore and really do, uh, dove deep on TOD development there uh, right at that uh, border. Great, thank you. Alan, do you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself? Thank you. Thank you, Chair Thompson and commissioners. Um, my name is Alan Dodderman. I work with TWG Development. We are a, a national for-profit affordable housing developer. And we have two projects that are currently under construction, one in Shoreline, it's about 250 units and it's considered TOD. And then there's one in Totem Lake that is about 125 units and they're all 100% affordable housing buildings. I, my experience in Kenmore with TOD is mainly looking at properties. There, there are a, a few properties that we did look at that were either for sale or for lease that we were interested in, in developing. And, and I should say that when I was doing that, um, I was actually with Imagine Housing. They're an east side uh, nonprofit affordable housing developer. And we were, we were interested in the Kenmore area. And even with my transition to TWG, I'm still very interested in the, in the TOD area of Kenmore with the affordable housing incentives that are in the TOD area and the ability to, to maximize affordable housing and minimize parking um, within that, in, in that overlay. Great, uh, Sarah, do you wanna go ahead? Sorry, all. Hi, I'm Sarah Lovell. I'm King County Metro's transit-oriented development manager. And um, I have been doing TOD uh, for Metro now for three years. Before that, I um, was the transit-oriented development program manager at Sound Transit. And I also worked a long time ago uh, doing some um, land economics for a little transit-oriented development specialty firm in the Bay Area. So I've been doing it from a bunch of different perspectives and mostly from the public side for a while. Um, and most recently since being in Metro, it's been fun because I've spent a lot of time um, over the last three years last three thinking years. about transit-oriented development at Kenmore, at the Kenmore Park and Ride, um, as a part of Sound Transit's BRT project that's located on um, Metro's Park and Ride lot. So spent a lot of time working with Kenmore staff and Sound Transit staff thinking about how best to incent transit-oriented development on that site. Great. Kevin. Thank you. Um, I'm with Main Street Property Group, a real estate development company, primary focus in transformative residential, retail, and mixed-use property, uh, primarily in the east side of Seattle. 
Um, our goal in everything we do is to form lasting relationships with each community, their visions, and turning them into reality. We're proud of our partnerships we've had with a lot of really great east side downtown cores, including Kenmore, Kirkland, Bothell, Sammamish, and Woodenville. Uh, Main Street Property Group has a great history with the city of Kenmore, having partnered with the city on a number of development projects over the last 10 years. We're very proud of the work we've done in the Kenmore Village project, um, including the seaplane, kitchen and bar, Spencer 68 residential development, link lofts, flyaway apartments, overall having developed 340 plus homes and over 40,000 square foot of commercial space. We've had a great partnership with the city of Kenmore. And from the beginning, we understood and embraced the values of the community, creating great places and spaces that are walkable and special. So we hope to do more development in the city of Kenmore. And so we really look forward to the TOD and, and what we can do to, to help. So thank you again. Great. Juan. Yeah, hi, can yeah. everybody hear me now? <laughs> Yes. Okay, great. I just switched the phone. I'm sorry for that. Yeah, my name is Juan. Thanks for having me in the panel. I'm a senior land use planner with the Office of Land Use Planning and Development from Sound Transit. And we, we started about three years ago working on stationary planning work with the city of Kenmore um, and King County Metro and other stakeholders uh, to develop a coordinated development plan with a vision around the Kenmore Park and Ride that included um, some of the parking needs that we that we have for the BRT uh, stride, which um, is already uh, in entering its uh, sixty percent design, and now um, at this point we're we're also in in the partnership with, with with King County and Kenmore, and it really represents an innovative opportunity to explore um, what TOD could look like at this site and. Uh, some of the initial studies that we looked at for the for the planned area included a, upwards of 400 units, mix of affordable and market rate. Um, so there's there's a lot of uh, interesting, innovative things happening, and it it could be uh, a phased project in the future, possible, uh, but definitely reflective of a mixed use to the environment um, of the kind that I think the city wants to see. And uh, it was interesting to hear that, um, you know, some of the some of the all questions that we that we that we will be talking about today in terms of how this could be a, a great opportunity um, for a region of the city that, that could see this kind of work. So, anyway, happy to be here and, and contributing to this conversation. Right. And our sixth Thanks. panelist, Imad Baba, is here. Yay! Perfect timing. Um, Imad. Thank you. Is we're starting with the very first question, which is uh, to introduce yourself and talk about your um, background and your experience or interest in TOD in Kenmore. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry for being late. It was good time. Um, thank you. I'm the owner and principal of IHB Architects, and we're in Kent, uh, Washington. Um, I've been I've had my own practice for 16 years and I've been in the industry for many more years than that. Um, we're a small firm. However, we've developed a, um, a, a rapport with many developers in the Puget Sound region. And we've had uh, lots of repeat clients uh, doing private development. And we've become, um, uh, fortunately, we've got a niche in the mixed use uh, arena. <clears throat> And we've done, uh, we've been involved in several TOD projects. First, I'll start by saying I'm currently the chair of the TOD advisory group uh, for the city of Tacoma. And we, um, we review and present our um, considerations for all things TOD to the council and planning commission and transportation commission at the city of Tacoma. Um, that's been a privilege for me the last couple of years. And we're going to extend that for one more year. Um, we have been involved in a uh, TOD project at, uh, in Kent at South 272nd near um, the Sound Transit Future Light Rail Station there. It's a park and ride. It's called Star Lake. Um, 
And um, we're, we're involved in the, uh, an adjacent property there that's TOD. We've been doing some preliminary planning um, and design work on that site. <clears throat> we have a TOD project in downtown Tacoma that is just broken ground. It's been the news re recently. Uh, it's right in the Freight House Square district in the Tacoma Dome district where, uh, again, another light rail station is, is being planned. We are uh, doing, we did a TOD project in Des Moines, um, Highline Place, which was phase one student housing, again, across the street from a, uh, the new rail station there in Kent, Des Moines. And phase two is a mixed use um, uh, uh, market rate project, not student housing, and that's on, on the same site. And then uh, lastly, <clears throat> we've been working on this site in uh, Kenmore for a um, uh, local developer that um, we first attempted to do a large 100 unit mixed use project there with some townhomes adjacent. But then when COVID hit, they unfortunately decided to um, change their program and scope to more of a, a townhouse project. So we ended up with about, uh, I want to say 30, 30 some odd units of townhomes instead. Um, so um, that's a little bit about me, and I look forward to uh, uh, hearing what you all have to say and, uh, and going through the questions tonight. Great. Well, again, thank you to all of you for joining us. We have a wealth of experience and expertise here. And with that, I'm going to jump right into our first TOD-related uh, question. This is kind of a lightning round, so maybe a, a minute or so in response. But... The question is, is the market ready for TOD in Kenmore? And if not, why not? And how do you tell when a market is ready? So maybe I'll start with Kevin. Sure. Um, we believe the market in Kenmore is ready for TOD. Um, we see the migration out of traditional urban areas and we're seeing an increased demand in some traditionally suburban markets and ones kind of centered around um, transit and mass transit and kind of rapid transit. So we kind of saw it with Redmond years back. Um, we think with the link light rail extension into Linwood and the proposed and under design SR522 bus rapid transit program that we've been talking about to connect Kenmore and the surrounding communities that this is going to be make Kenmore a desirable location for TOD development. And I think kind of a sign that the market is ready. Great. Sarah. Thanks. Yeah, no, I think um, the market in Kenmore is ready. We, um, Juan will probably say something similar as, as part of the, the BRT project um, and the TUD visioning, there was a market study conducted in 2019 and it did prove out that the market appeared to be ready that TUD style development was feasible. Um, and so while the market has definitely been in sort of a, an uncertain place due to COVID, um, it certainly was there before. Um, and you know, we would expect that it would either still be there or be there shortly <laughs> um, whenever we get back to a place where we can all see each other in person. Um, so I, I think, yes, and in terms of what kind of indicators we look for um, in terms of considering whether the market's ready. I mean, obviously we start looking at things like, you know, um, plant projects and planning and permits and, and sort of uh, cost per square foot based on appraisal and things like that. But also looking at the transit usage at the park and ride, for example, which was like very, very high before. I mean, it was at over hundred percent and Metro was leasing property other places. Clearly there was demand to be in that location. Um, and and so for all of those reasons, I mean, at the time too, there was that the market study was done, there was sort of a scan of surrounding communities and demand that they were seeing through new projects in places like Bothell and Kenmore and um, Woodenville. And, you know, that was sort of a consistent picture. So I'd say yes, and hopefully yes still. <laughs> Alan, how about you? Yeah, I, I would say so. I mean, we've been interested in Kenmore, you know, as in specifically the TOD area for 100% affordable housing projects um, for quite a few years. 
I, I, I must say though that you know there's there's a a lot of demand and high expectations for affordable housing in Kenmore that I've heard from from a lot of comments, but unfortunately the last census kind of changed the the funding makeup for 100% affordable housing in Kenmore. Uh, there's there the Kenmore used to be what in what's called a um, difficult to develop area. And that was an area that was, you know, designated by HUD, and that allowed for an additional funding boost that would really help bring affordable housing into a city. But Kenmore's no longer in that difficult to develop area. HUD has taken away that 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 criteria or that classification, and for which makes it a lot more difficult for an affordable housing developer to build something that's 100% affordable housing in 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 Kenmore. We're, we're still interested in, you know, if we could get, if we can find the right site um, and, and find the right funding to make up the difference from, you know, that, that boost that you would get, uh, we, we would still develop there. Jenkins. Yeah, maybe I, I take a little bit of a contrary stand. I, I think the aspiration is that uh, Kenmore would be ready, especially as, you know, it's got a pretty unique location being kind of the halfway point between the east side and Seattle. So it seems like a natural place for the TOD, especially 522 right off there, uh, to be able to access both sides of the lake. Um, so I think for that, the market is ready. But um, in, in regards to uh, you know, fewer parking or less parking regulate or uh, less parking, um, kind of this reliance on this on the TOD itself on the transit oriented. I, I don't know if it's quite there, um, just from my perspective as finding renters and people who want to be there without cars. Um, but at the same time, I think it, it, if you wait till everybody's going to be ready, it's going to be too late to develop an asset. So in that case, it is, you know, we, we got to start making moves to make it a TOD part. You are muted, Lori. <laughs> On one, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, I guess I guess everybody has thought a little bit of what, what I was thinking, but the market study that was conducted by our consultants uh, back when we started the stationary planning work were pretty specific in the in the products that were ready um, during the time that the market study was conducted, and namely apartments was was definitely a strong market. At the, at the time that was being conducted, that was pre-pandemic and things have changed a little bit uh, since then, but there was, there was already an indication that office uh, was, was not as strong and that the, the retail would be the kind of retail that requires um, parking availability and, and not, so much the, not, not so much the ground related retail. Um, market so so i think there it, it is an area that's in, very much in transition the park and ride uh data that, that we're getting from partner trying to partner agencies uh looks like the usages are currently uh down from where they used to be i mean uh, this this park and ride for example was at capacity um in the in the 2019 um numbers and, it, and it's come down to a bit, maybe about half so I think another thing to look at is is what what Alan was saying that the the capacity for 100% affordable housing uh, uh, affordable housing projects that are not mixed income maybe has has changed a little bit in 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 a function of how the uh, the funding environment has changed so that's something to be looked at more deeper so I think if if that could be better understood in the future that would really helpful for this area, so. Imad. Well, I have to start by saying I'm, unfortunately, I'm not uh, too familiar with the Kenmore uh, area. This is our first project there. However, um, it appears um, that there's a, um, a recent, there's a density buildup. There's the current the zoning and planning um, background uh, efforts are, are there and uh, in place. Uh, transportation modes are um, adjacent and um, uh, being built up. And so um, also 
from your city's community and econ economic development director um, pushing for uh, a TOD project there. It just feels like there's definitely uh, synergy and um, that it is ready. Um, the affordable housing component, I think, is is vital in in almost every jurisdiction right now. Uh, at least at least attempting a 20% affordable housing element is, I think, critical uh, to meet the need. And so um, that's where uh, that's where I stand on that. Great. Okay, moving on to our next question. Um, this is another round robin question. And uh, if you are thinking about Kenmore's TOD development standards and you all uh, receive copies of those, uh, is there an obstacle to TOD development that immediately comes to mind? We're gonna talk uh, more in depth about all of the standards, but if there was one, two, that immediately rose to the top of your mind, uh, if we could just go around and you could let us know what that is. Uh, Jenkins, we'll start with you. Yeah, mine's maybe not as related to the, the directly in the development standards, but I think the biggest obstacle that uh, is the the size of the parcels. And so you you have a lot of small parcels there that in order to really take advantage of TOD development, you're going to have to start doing some assemblages. And so what's I think uh, a big obstacle is um, that process of of getting enough parcels on board to have an assemblage large enough to to make a TOD development worthwhile. Uh, so I don't think necessarily think it's anything in the zoning itself, but I think it's the zone that it's in. Great, Sarah. So I think there's not one huge, you know, there's not one red flag per se. I think we've talked a little bit about how, you know, Kenmore is an area of transition and there's still maybe a necessity for a car, but the parking requirements being that there are minimums um, rather than maximums, things like that, like th those start to sort of point um, cost of projects in, in a, you know, in a higher spot. And it definitely is a tension in thinking about how to basically bring to the market a, a project that usually is sort of thought of as one where there are, um, you know, high quality design and lots of lots of sort of big ticket items that are associated with projects that you will think of as TOD. Um, having having um, so, uh, a more significant parking requirement still is is tricky. There are other things, but that's that's probably the one the one thing. Okay, Alan. I think the the one thing is parking. I mean, that's 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 always a challenge on on projects in jurisdictions or municipalities that that um, have a little bit higher parking expectations than maybe others that with TOD areas where they 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 allow parking to be based on actual car ownership or usage uh, city of Kirkland is is an example of that where we can get parking modifications from the code uh, when we do a parking study showing what the actual parking demand is based on usage for similar affordable housing projects. And being able to apply that can help a great deal with keeping the, you know, the total development cost down for an affordable housing project. And if there was, if you had that ability in Kenmore, um, that, that could help quite a bit. I, I did, you know, I have looked at three large enough properties in, in Kenmore. And it, with each one of them, parking did kind of become one of those thresholds where it, it, it would make the project potentially too expensive to be competitive for, for the public funding that we would need. And having the ability to just shave off a little bit where to where you're providing parking based on known data of, of car ownership would help quite a bit. Imad. Uh, yes. <clears throat> well, I'm not sure. I think um, one. I'm not sure it's a zoning element that is an obstacle, but um, but the one thing that I'm reading down here is the 10% affordable housing cap. Um, we can talk about that later as it comes up. But um, I think it needs to be higher, like 20% uh, 
again, again because we're so lacking in that uh, that piece of the housing sector that I think it needs to be increased. Um, par I, I would second what Alan said about parking. It's always a challenge and um, having that as low as possible in a TOD district is a benefit to and enticement to most developers. They're always wanting to reduce parking as much as possible because of the cost, especially if it's a podium project with the concrete uh, structure. Uh, so I, I think those are a, a couple of the obstacles that I'm noticing. Okay, Juan. Yeah, I think everybody, um, I echo a lot of what I'm hearing, but I think to add maybe on the parking reduction, but I feel like it could be a case where like the closer you are to the transit uh, walk, five minute walk shed could be uh, striving for parking maximums rather than minimums. Um, so kind of doing it that way, but also maybe like the incentive structure of how developers um, can start building higher is not clear. Uh, it, it is clear that you guys want density from what the code language has, but it's not clear if you want bonus, um, if, you know, some other jurisdictions provide incentives for extra bonus floor or some things like that. And um, so the height limit, I think it's right now 65 feet. And I know we're, we might talk about that later, but how do you change that perhaps to the floors that could be above the podium level and uh, as, as uh, Iman was mentioning. And then there's also some other uh, things in the, I think in the district that are just this natural elements like the wetlands and things like that, that start, uh, I guess, encroaching, if you will, into a multiple multiple parcels and those parcels are going to be uh, affected by that natural feature so how how does that uh, either get played into the into the requirements or not uh, is an interesting thing so I think and I think I, look, there is a piece about the tree grove retention requirements that maybe he's trying to 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 tackle some of that or or tie into that but it'd be interesting to to understand how the how the the structure really incentivizes incentivizes the development you guys want to see in specific locations in specific parcel areas. So that is kind of a uh, a way to see it right now from the obstacle perspective. But yeah, parking is a huge one, and affordable housing and, and the natural um, requirements as well. So. Okay, uh, can Lori, I? Can I, oh. Lori, can I interrupt for a second? Uh, okay, or uh, go ahead and then we'll let Kevin go. Sorry, I just wanted to say one more thing that I, I missed on my list is the multifamily tax exemption um, allowance that needs to be clearly stated in for TOD projects because again, developers are, are seeking that all the time. And uh, I think there's usually an eight year or 12 year um, MFTE. So those just need to be clear in all TOD zones. That's my two cents worth on that piece. Thank you. Okay, Kevin, finish off the question. Here we go. Um, <clears throat> well, yeah, we see the development standards less as obstacles, but opportunities um, to kind of make location specific adjustments to help um, entice development in this area. And I think these are going to be a lot of what we talk about tonight, uh, but they're targeted areas that I think many other cities, TOD um, standards have been embraced and have been successful. And I think with the risk of sounding like a broken record, uh, parking height, and I think tree retention would be kind of at the top of the list as things that, you know, we could spend a little time on and discuss and, and kind of work on. So I know that everybody has already talked about that. And I, uh, I second, third and fourth that. Okay, great. Well, that's a good lead in to the next question, which is uh, about the development standards. And um, do any of these standards make developing more difficult? And the first one, we have a whole list. And this is anybody who wants to jump in, just raise your hand or unmute yourself. Um, Debbie is going to help make sure that I catch everybody who wants to speak. But the first question is height limitation, which is 65 feet is I've heard from a couple of you already that that's a potential issue. I'd, I'd like to comment if that's all right. 
Mm -hmm. You can just jump in. Okay. Um, yeah, I, for affordable housing, of course, you know, in that lens, um, especially in Kenmore, the most we would build is seven floors and having the ability to build seven floors within a height limit where you can have 10 foot floor to floor height is, is what we would seek. Um, going any taller than that is just too expensive for affordable housing. Others, any comments? Yeah, if I can step in here as well. Um, in total agreement with Alan, uh, I would agree that, you know, we'd be looking to increase that height limit to try and minimize any below grade parking and bring that out of there. I think there's some, you know, potential high water tables in the areas and some of the areas in the TOD district. So to stay out of that water table, um, I think would be helpful for the feasibility of a lot of these projects um, or potential projects. Okay, uh, I see Iman has his hand up. Sure, um, I'd like to say that, um, you know, most five over two podium projects are limited by the um, IBC, the building code and 75 feet is sort of the max for this type of construction. I think you need to be at least there. Um, and there are jurisdictions that offer, um, you know, 25% increase in their um, height limitation. Uh, Kent does that and others do as well. Or there's some bonus incentives where you, whatever you do with the roof structure or step backs or setbacks um, can also increase the height. But I think we need to target at least 75 feet to get that maximum podium level um, project uh, uh, working. Okay. Any other comments on height or we'll start talking about density? I think Sarah has a hand up, Laurie. Okay. Yeah. Oh, there it is, the little yellow hand. Sorry, I know. <laughs> um, I, just, uh, I would just echo what everybody said. And I think Kevin's point about the high water table um, given the wetlands that has, you know, been talked about a little bit is, is a, a real consideration here, but also, um, while, while I agree with everybody who said you're not going to go really above 75 feet, I think allowing up to 85, like no one's going to go to steel, I don't think at this point, right, but allowing the flexibility to figure out how to sort of maximize your um, building envelope um, and the, having a little bit of flexibility about how to handle parking would be really beneficial. Okay, so the next uh, development standard has to do with minimum density. So if you want to build in the TOD, you have to build at least 60 dwelling units per acre. Any reactions to that? Okay, well, <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> um, maximum density, uh, you can develop up to 150 dwelling units per acre. I see Alan. I, I think if you're going to um, entertain increasing building height that you, you need to be able to increase your dwelling units per acre. The, the few studies that I did, I found that six stories with a normal mix of units, you were, you were reaching um, that 150 units per acre limit. Mm -hmm. So adding another floor, you just you know, it, there's no point in adding another, in another floor if, if you're already at your 150. And someone else had one, was it you? Yeah, one. Yeah, well, I, and, and I'm obviously not coming from the developer's perspective, more from the planning, but used to seeing in other codes and other partner jurisdictions that they handle more of an, of an F, FAR max, um, structure, right, floor area ratios, rather than the maximum of a, of, of, a, of a set number of dwelling units. So I think, and, you know, it seems like having that magic number, it's also, uh, there's a variety of sizes of, of units of, I'm sorry, of parcel sizes. And, and in some cases, developers will be able to, to assemble par parcels together to get all of a sudden a three acre site, five acre and, and that number is gonna start growing. So maybe the, the max number of units is not necessarily the desire, but the, the, 
the form around it that wants to be maintained in, in, in terms of floors and building height. So just mentioning that. Okay. Any other I, comments? Oh, yeah. I, can I, I, just, I would just like to comment on what, what Juan was saying. And, and being a former uh, planning commission chair and going through this exercise a few years ago, you know, we had that same question in our city is do we go to FAR or do we go with, you know, dwelling units per, per acre? And we found that you have to make sure that your FAR actually is, is realistic with the dwelling units per acre that you're, you're trying to substitute. You know, you don't want you don't want to have an FAR of 5.0 because you're never going to get that with your building height, and so you, you really need to study to make sure that that the FAR is a good match with your building height and and expected, I guess, coverage lot coverage. Mad, you had your Sarah, hand up. Sarah has her hand up too. Okay, well, um, Imad, why don't you go ahead? I saw your hand first, and then we'll go to Sarah. <laughs> okay. Um, I agree that the um, the uh, the the uh, density maximum density probably doesn't want to be limited to a number of units because the mix is always different um, depending on what the goal is of the development. I think that so so what what Alan said I think is correct. The FAR needs to be um, uh, either uh, included as part of a, a variable height. Some jurisdictions do that, or well, the taller the building, the, the, the higher the FAR becomes, and that needs to be coordinated. Um, and so I think it's important to, and then coverage is also can, can uh, determine density like 60% or 70% of the site area coverage is usually what it's set at. All those things I think need to be um, played in or considered instead of a maximum density. Sarah. Um. I am just echoing what everybody said about FAR. I think it's a little bit more, I think it's a little bit more flexible tool. I think it would be um, a better way to accomplish the kind of um, physical form that I think can more seeking and it gives a little bit of flexibility. So you're not um, sharpening your pencil to try to figure out what size your units have to be and how to maximize or minimize, you know, it, I think, mm -hmm. I think FAR is probably a better tool, but like Alan said, it definitely is something that has to be right sized. So, okay, uh, the next development standard to talk about is parking requirements. We've already heard a lot about that. Are there additional uh, comments? Um, what about um, the affordable housing requirements? You skipped over that. Oh, did I? Oh, I did. Okay. You're following along more closely than me. Well, I, I, <laughs> How about I actually, the affordable housing requirements? I, I actually had a specific question to that. I just wanted to make sure uh -huh. I was reading that correctly. Um, is, is this saying that you can't have an 100% affordable housing project in the TOD? No, it's the requirement is capped at 10%. So you have to provide at least 10%, but you certainly can do more. Okay. So I, other didn't, I, didn't have, I didn't have any other comments on that. Okay, how about others? Comments on the affordable housing requirement? Uh, Juan has his hand up and so does Sarah. Okay, Juan. Um, yeah, just really quickly, I, I think Imad or somebody uh, earlier said that, you know, the, the inclusionary can be uh, boosted up to perhaps something higher, like uh, more, more aggressive to like 20% to maybe match something like that, an MFT type of goal. Um, but also there there are some, uh, there is some language that it was hard for me to read in the code that talks about the, the, the tier one, tier two, and tier three of affordability. And as you go into those tiers, there's more math for the developers to perform. And they, they tended to be a little bit confusing. And I was trying to, understand the goal, but it, but it, in essence, the, the affordable housing that that's required or, or yeah, required to get the bonus density units is not that much as, as it, as it turns out uh, in the very low income category. So um, maybe in a way, like maybe having whatever program is set to be, uh, or the goals to have a more sizable um, 
projects that have the the very low income or whether it's an in lieu that goes into um, a specific very low income uh, bucket i'm I'm coming up with stuff right now, but it seems like it's almost like it wants to be more sizable when those opportunities happen um, and that's it I'll, I'll stop there okay. Sarah. Um, I was just going to say that I think I was also going to say the tears. I had to read them a few times and I was doing some math. Uh, and I think I think they're very it's clear that, um, you know, that Kenmore is really interested in in getting a lot of affordable housing produced by the private market, that there is an interest in making sure that what's provided, um, you know, meets the needs of households at a variety of income levels. And so I felt like the intention behind it is clear. but whenever, and I forgive me all the folks that are in this call that are developers, I always think that like, as I'm thinking about how I'm writing an RFP or something, the more straightforward the requirement, the easier it is to like back of the napkin, the more likely I feel like it is for people to actually respond and, and to push people into doing more. So it just, it felt like to Juan's point, maybe you could actually be more aggressive with your um, inclusionary requirement if it was, a little bit more straightforward and easier to understand, but maybe hear from developers. They might feel differently. That was just my impression. Kevin, do you want to speak to it? Looks like you have your hand up. Yeah, I would just say as a minimum requirement, I think 10% gives you the opportunity, especially if you want to encourage development in the area, it gives you that wide range of you could go 100% affordable, you could also go 90 and 10. So I think as you guys are, are kind of doing this to say we want TOD development or we want this to be um, something that people, you know, uh, an area that TOD development has is successful that giving the most flexibility is something that's probably going to be important so that you can attract as many projects or as many developers or developments that you can. Great. And I might just comment, um, we, I think, at the staff level also agree that the tier one, tier two, tier three um, approach is, is confusing, and we hope to clarify that as part of the amendments. The other thing I wanted to mention is that the uh, City Council uh, has recently talked about affordability in the TOD, and, and they, uh, their initial comments were that uh, maybe a 25% uh, affordable housing requirement uh, would be appropriate, at least for some interim regulations. Um, so I throw that out as well. And someone, I think Jenkins, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was. I was going to say. Uh, I think the like like Kevin was saying. I think the flexibility is uh, is a good thing in order to get projects in the door to actually start the TOD off. But um, at the same time, if you leave it so flexible, then by the time more projects projects are coming on, maybe maybe all of them are at the you know just the ten percent affordable uh, level without the deep affordability um, that the region might be looking for. And so uh, this might be, maybe it's a possible tie-in with the Pioneer Project incentives where, you know, the first projects that are coming into this TOD have an opportunity to do maybe less affordable housing, but at least you get a, you know, five over two or six over two um, projects being built instead of townhomes. And then later on, as that, um, that flexibility is kind of used up, now you get into the projects that are coming online in a couple of years, two, three years, where there is a more stringent affordability requirement. Um, and, and that gives the kind of the loss leader, the first projects going, the incentive to get in the door, get development going, but it also gives Kenmore the ability then to later on say, no, we need more affordable units than just 10% at the moderate income level. Um, so, so combining those two incentives would maybe get some more uh, starts, but then also, uh, can more the ability to be a little bit more stringent on fulfilling the needs of affordable. Right. Any other comments on uh, the affordable housing requirement? Okay. Now we'll go to parking. <laughs> uh, any additional comments on uh, parking? Going once. Yeah. yeah oh, actually, maybe it's a. Um, <laughs> 
I don't know, maybe it's just food for thought. So I know everybody um, from a cost perspective obviously wants uh, less, uh, less parking requirements. I, I still think of it as maybe I'm, maybe I'm a few years um, too behind the times, but I do think of it as, um, yeah, you know, my, my project that I developed in Kenmore, um, I ended up needing this, we're not needing, but I ended up selling it to another home builder. And, you know, the biggest issue I had, the biggest complaint is that I didn't provide enough parking, right? And so I, um, I, I just struggle with the balance of, yes, there's a cost up front for parking, especially with larger projects. Um, but at the same time, the, the market to, to get your tenants or homeowners into the into the door, you know, they're still requiring parking all around. Even even projects up, we have a couple of projects up on Capitol Hill in Seattle. You know, we still are looking at a market that wants parking, um, and so I, I always struggle with that balance. Um, and I get the aspirational. We want to be a carless society. I, I love that. I would love to be you know buses and light rail everywhere. But I don't know if we're there yet, especially. You know, still on the fringes of the suburbs here. So um, I just want to put that. Juan, I think you have your hand up. Yeah, I think that that's a great point. That you know, at the end of the day, there there has to be cars to to provide um, that option for for a lot of the residents in in different jurisdictions. But you know, taking also uh, advantage of the opportunity that there's there are these uh, park and rides and other places that might have, uh, in other words, um, surplus parking that could be um, shared amongst uses. I think it's an opportunity that's being explored in other jurisdictions as well. And that might be something that the TLD overlay can explore and how, how sharing parking across uses can also uh, reduce the overall need. Uh, and, and base it on a demand parking demand analysis model uh, rather than than just just as ratios. So I think that's something we we always we always try to think of think of as we're looking um, at plans and jurisdictions. So that's it. Okay, Kevin. Yeah, I would just say you know I think some flexibility in the parking requirements um, could be. You know, a good a good way to go about this, especially in the TOD zone, where I think the nature is you know transit oriented design, and encouraging the use of the transit in the area. And I think to Jenkins' point, if you're building these big projects, it's it's you know on the developer or whoever the owner, whoever's building it to understand the market. And if there is a need to have one to one parking, then you know if you want your development to be successful and it to be able to get rented up, you're going to, you're going to have to make adjustments, but I think there's also flexibility. If you say the market, you know, especially near these transit um, stops doesn't need as much parking that you could do less parking and maybe that gives you more density. And so that's, I think something to think about as far as flexibility and maybe you know, making the requirements a little less stringent. Um, so it gives people the opportunity. Sarah? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that, so, you know, as, as someone that has been doing TOD sort of exclusively for a long time, obviously I'm in the less parking camp, but, but I, I do totally hear what Jenkins is saying. And it, it is a reality that in lots of communities, we're not quite there yet. We don't have quite the, um, you know, it's not not quite enough transit um, service to really be carless. And so we're sort of on this continuum of trying to get there. And we're talking about regulations that hopefully will have some longevity. Um, but I am also just going to say that I do think that having flexibility in the code so that you can have parking requirements based on demand would be a really sort of a nice in the middle. Um, and the other thing that I have been sort of noodling on a little bit is whether there's an opportunity when you think about parking requirements to tie those to other mobility improvements. Because one thing I do notice in the code is that there are also requirements for, um, you know, a lot of pedestrian infrastructure uh, associated with these projects. 
and when you really think about um, like a transit oriented development project holistically, it's really about, you know, having great access to lots of amenities, including maybe most importantly transit, but also lots of other things. And so I wondered if in thinking or designing a more flexible requirement around parking, you could also link it to other modes of, um, you know, other mobility modes and whether there's some improvement you know, on bike paths or on pedestrian paths, and you can count some of those improvements towards this requirement or something like that. I mean, think about that a little bit, but but I, I, I do like all of these things cost, you know, have a cost associated with them. And as, as communities like Kenmore are gonna be receiving more transit and becoming more dense, um, I think there's that opportunity. Jenkins? Yeah, actually, I just I wanted to uh, respond. Actually, I think Juan said, um, you know, looking at opportunities to maybe cross use uh, different parcels. And, and, you know, when I think about Timor's TOD over or the district as it currently stands, I just don't think if, if every developer went in there and provided a minimal amount of parking, there, there aren't very many options for guests to come, right? And so there isn't a whole plethora of streets that you can currently park on. So the, the, it would almost be overwhelmed, I think, with people who are in cars coming. And, and so that was, I think, a lot of my concern too. Is it just the permanent residents or the commercial businesses that need their parking? But ultimately, if there isn't enough parking, there aren't options in Kenmore like there might be in other suburbs because um, nobody's parking on 522 and then Safeway parking lot, right? So, but what, what, what Juan was saying was maybe more applicable then is if there can be some, um, some research into um, incentivizing cross use, hey, this one is, this area can be more used for some surface parking and I hate surface parking, so I say that very, lightly, but just something um, where there's some brainstorming around what are the options if, uh, if we do reduce the parking requirements. Iman. I'm in the same boat as Jenkins on this one where, you know, there's there needs to be a balance. I hear all, all the time that our, the developers, um, my developer clients want less parking so they can increase their units number of units. However, the planners and city councils want more parking because there's always a high demand and people don't complain that there aren't enough, there isn't enough parking. So there is really, it, it's really a dichotomy, I think. And I'm, I agree with what Jenkins has been saying. There needs to be some kind of balance and maybe there's some um, new incentives. Like one idea is to offer um, ORCA cards to the residents that, um, if you uh, if you want to uh, reduce parking, then you have to offer ORCA cards in some manner to the residents um, or shared parking, as some people have been already speaking of uh, Juan and Jenkins. And it has to be demand based and it has to be based on a market uh, research in that uh, demographic. So it has to be, you know, localized. It can't just be broad based. So I think all of those things um, are need to be considered. Uh, but the balancing act is is really a tough one uh as in in an emergency in a, sorry in an emerging urban market like kenmore again it's on the fringe but um we just have to be careful not to um uh, ask for too much um or too little parking at, at this time and just um consider some of those incentives okay uh alan yeah, I, I just would like to comment on our experience with other cities, east side cities. Um, you know, when when we do request parking density reductions, usually it's accompanied with a parking study. And that parking study does demonstrate that there is not the need to have as much parking as what the city is requiring. And then a lot of times in order to you know, to be able to proceed with the reduced parking, we, we have to enter into a parking management plan to make sure that we're not, you know, our projects are not burdening adjacent properties with people that, you know, that live in the units or live in the building, but there's no room for them to park. And so those are two key components that, that we face all the time with, you know, with reduced parking densities. And I have to kind of comment on, 
um, you know, one project that we did recently about actually about four years ago, we did a parking study where there was a, a park and ride next door to a project and the parking study, the analysis that was done revealed that the market rate building, even though they charged, they charged for parking, they, they didn't fill all the parking stalls. So not all the parking stalls were rented out because they were next to a park and ride because everybody was parking at the park and ride. So they didn't have to pay for parking. So that's kind of, you know, people find ways to, to avoid, you know, having to pay for parking and they'll use the most convenient way, like parking on the street or parking in a park and ride. So that's all my comments. Okay. Well, I don't see any other hands raised, so I'll move to the last set of development standards, which have to do with design. Uh, any comments on the design standards that are part of the TOD? Go ahead, Alan. Okay. Um, yeah, I had a few here that, um, that I just wanted to bring up. Um, one of them is is upper level setbacks, and I, and I, if I remember correctly, in Canmore, you really only need to have a, an upper level setback at the street side or the street front face. But with affordable housing, you know, you're you're trying to maximize the number of units on property, and and having that setback, you know doesn't help maximize it, especially if you have to have setbacks on more than one side. And it's fine. I mean, we can get around it pretty easily if the setback occurs above the podium. And then there's no additional setbacks as you go up the building. But every time you set back from the face of the building, it just adds to the cost and it also reduces the, basically the living space of the units. Because you, you, you have to stack your corridors, you have to stack everything. And when you set, if you're up at the sixth floor or fifth floor and you got to set back another six feet, you have to take it out of the living space. And we, we just don't like to have reduced living spaces just trying to accommodate a design standard that, you know, I, I understand, you know, the purposes of setbacks, but sometimes they just kind of defeat the purpose of, of, you know, what you're trying to accomplish with affordable housing. And then... <clears throat> The other thing is, is commercial space requirements, especially if they're really onerous or excessive. And, and I, I don't think that, I don't remember exactly what Kenmore's commercial you know, space requirements are on certain streets, but if they're more than, you know, more than 5% of the total of the, you know, the total building or, 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 or at least the footprint, it just becomes too excessive and it's it's really hard for an affordable housing developer to to find a partner to either own that space or or to be in a position to you know have to lease that space out it it just creates too much cost and too much risk for the project to have that in there so if there's the flexibility to be able to use community space for that specific resident building um, as as a substitute for commercial space, that would be our preference, and that would you know that would help make the, the, the just the, just eliminate risks out of the out of the project. Okay, Iman. Um, I think the commercial space um, standard. I, I agree with with everything Alan said that it does need to be limited, especially with this, um, I guess, new um, new market that we have after COVID, where commercial space is difficult to lease and people are mostly working from home. There's sort of a new era. And I, I think cities haven't adjusted yet, um, but it, I think it needs to happen. And 5% is really, I think, the, the limit, 5 to 10 max. We like 5% better, but I totally agree with that. Or, it's a deterrent to developers, I have to say. Um, also, open space requirements need to be reasonable. Um, one jurisdiction we're working with is, uh, you know, set on this huge open space requirement and offering no fee in lieu. I think you have to offer a fee in lieu if you can't achieve it because 
um, uh, density in an urban setting, you can't have a lot of open space. So it just needs to be strongly considered. Okay, uh, Sarah. You know, I was just thinking as, as um, my mom was talking about the green space requirement that maybe I'm jumping ahead to a different question. So I can hold my comment until we get back to other amendments. <laughs> Okay, well, the next question actually um, has to do with the incentives and and really uh, the question was, there are a number of incentives in the regulations, a tree grove incentive allows more units and potentially more parking if there's a certain type of tree retention. We've talked briefly about the pioneer project uh, bonus where you get uh, you have less parking requirement for the first 100 units. And also, uh, we've acknowledged that the MFTE program uh, overlays the TOD area. So that um, incentive is available. Are there generally any comments about the incentives? Okay. Yeah, I was going to say it's been it's been five years, and I know the MFTE actually. I think I, I helped implement that in 2017, but the TOD has been around for five years, and there hasn't been a single project. I think that you know the proof is in the pudding that these incentives have not been strong enough to attract anything. Um, in regards to um, the tree grove retention, I think it's very you know parcel specific. Obviously, if you have those tree groves or not. I think a lot of the, uh, the parcels along the 522 don't have that ability. Uh, the Pioneer project, it's great that it goes towards parking, but again, uh, it's not strong enough to have incentivized anybody. In regards to the MFTE, I did have a couple of, um, I guess, questions or concerns as I've seen, and, and I think a lot of the other panelists have more experience with MFTEs, but um, on this one, it sounds like I believe it's it's for the life of the entire project. So there is no sunset on that. Whereas I think I've seen other covenants of you know 20 to 50 years. I, I don't know if that has a huge difference in the underwriting of a project, um, but maybe some re some loosening there to allow for um, flexibility of future development. That um, you know maybe uh, you know changing the the life of uh, of the MFT itself. Uh, and then there is still some confusion. I think it kind of goes along with the tier stuff with, uh, it, it talks about how the MFT is only to the qualifying value of improvements. And I wasn't sure upon rereading that, whether that meant it's only applicable to the affordable units as what's qualified for the value of improvements, or if it's across the board for all of your resident, uh, the residential units. I know it's not given on the land or commercial uh, because it's a multifamily tax exemption, but I wasn't shown that, so I was hoping for some clarification. Well, I wish I could provide you the clarification, but I can't. <laughs> but that's certainly something we can look at and, and your comments are still very valid. Uh, Sarah. Yeah, um, I was going to say, so I was just, uh, I was just, as Jenkins was talking, I was just looking at the MFTE um, <laughs> program right up. Uh, and it looks like it's 12 years, yeah. right? And For so, I, yeah. And so I think like I, where I've used MFTE and other projects, it's been an incredibly uh, useful tool to really get market rate developers to perform affordable housing, um, even, you know, 12 years is temporary, right? But it's it's not so temporary. Um, and if you're really trying to increase the stock to meet an immediate need, it's, it's a pretty useful tool. So, sorry, sorry, uh, just the, my, my clarification. Yeah, the 12 years totally get eight or 12 years. I was talking about the requirement for the affordability that's part it. of it being for uh, for the life of the project. Right, for the inclusionary, and that's yeah. 50, I think. And that that is a big deal, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. Um, but I think the MFT, the MFTE is great in combination with the um, the inclusionary zoning. It's interesting to, I mean, I guess because there hasn't been a project in the TUD overlay zone, I'd be curious to see how it how those two get layered, um, or if it doesn't. And, and I do think that um, Jenkins' point about people not um, taking advantage of the overlay zone so far, you know, does definitely point to incentives need to be restructured or, or rethought and. Um, the Pioneer Project is really interesting, but 
but I don't think it goes quite far enough. I, you know, it's not quite enough. And I was also confused if, you know, if we're talking about it just applying to the bonus units that the projects have qualified for, then does it get dispersed across multiple projects? Probably, but also maybe that's not really enough to make a dent in your parking requirement, or maybe that isn't really the incentive that developers are looking for. And the tree grove retention, I think, you know, it's, it is another thing that points to Kenmore's um, sort of dedication to preserving the natural environment and that being a real amenity in the city, but it's a little confusing too. So um, <laughs> those are my, those are my thoughts. Okay, Kevin. Yeah, I just had a comment <clears throat> on tree grove retention. And I think it is very lot specific and kind of area specific. But I think seeing as we haven't had any TOD developments in the area, none of these incentives have been used, you know, maybe an idea, um, you know, in concert with or, or another incentive is green building. Um, and whether that's, you know, you get bonus density or an expedited approval process, something that's also environmentally conscious um, and maybe something that's more um, you know, could be more successful because I think the tree grove retention kind of gets to lot size. And then if you're going for higher density, do you have enough space to retain those tree groves and actually use that bonus would be the question. Um, and then, you know, with the multifamily tax exemption, I think it's always something that you look for. Um, and maybe it's just, it hasn't been used or, or these incentives hasn't been used because maybe there's, you know, we're talking about all of these um, TOD standards that are in place now, and maybe as a whole, it just doesn't make sense for feasibility of projects. And if we change some of these standards and, and get some more flexibility that we would see these incentives being used. All right. Well, we have about 15 minutes and we have uh, three questions left. So I'm going to go through the next two uh, fairly quickly, and then I want to spend a few minutes talking about extending the TOD to downtown. So the next question, and uh, initially we were talking about doing this in a roundtable format, but I think I'll just have people jump in. Are there other standards or amendments that would make the TOD more likely? We've talked about lots of different standards, but did we miss anything? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Oh, Sarah has a hand. Sarah has a hand up. I do. Yeah. Um, so this is one thing that Juan, who just, he's having some difficulty actually with his setup. So he's oh, around oh. here. But um, he and I have talked about this and I definitely wanted to make sure I brought it up. Um, you know, partic particularly because we've been focused so much on the park and ride and there's the heron rookery. And so we've been really sort of thinking a lot about the wetlands and, and their impact on development. Something that I'm, really I wanted to throw out there because we talked about it a bit is um, thinking about within the TOD overlay zone pooling like your green factor requirement or something like that so that if you are um, if you own a property or you're trying to develop a property where you have a lot of undevelopable area because it's wetland or it's you know it's um, difficult to develop or something like that you could potentially uh, you know basically opt into like maybe you Maybe you try to find, or you you try to um, contribute into some sort of conservation credit or some sort of pooling of of the um, conservation area, so that you could potentially sort of think about transfer of development rights or something like that, um, or potentially not end up. Maybe it's just a benefit because you contribute the area that's not developable back to the city. Uh, and therefore you have some kind of tax benefit because you're not paying taxes on the part that you can't actually develop. But there seems to be um, both a real desire and need to preserve all of the environmentally critical areas. And that could really be built into the code so that it benefits projects and benefits folks that are trying to get projects out of the ground by you know, taking advantage of places where there's a real need to conserve um, and desire to conserve. Um, environmentally sensitive areas and then credit, you know, sort of smear that credit around so you can actually get more density where it's possible. Imad. 
Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think one, one thing we struggled with through our, our design process was the, the time it took to get through um, commercial site plan review or design review process. And I think if you incentivize that, create an expedited streamlined process for TOD projects, you, you, may, um, you, may, you may attract more TOD. I mean, it, it would be great to expedite that whenever possible. Um, and I know it's all staff related and project related and the influx of uh, projects, um, but some kind of maybe um, uh, incentive as to, to have an expedited review process for TOD projects. That's one idea. Um, second idea is to offer as much flexibility as possible in your design standards in the TOD um, uh, overlay area. Uh, for example, percent reductions or increases, whatever the criteria may be, um, offer as much flexibility as possible. And then I think something that Jenkins spoke to earlier was to bolster the bolster, sorry, the MFTE um, regulations and just make sure they're strongly incentivized so that developers can actually use them um, as as often as possible. Because that's a, that's a big dollar amount for 12 years to be saved by a developer. And so those are the few things that I would offer. Jenkins. Yeah, actually, I just wanted to second both uh, Sarah and Maud's uh, comments, and, and especially the expedited review. I, I think as a private developer, what, you know, uh, costs uh, are real important, but also just the efficiency and, and velocity, right? How fast can we get through this? Um, and City of Kenmore, I, I loved your guys' staff. I think it's been one of my best experiences in jurisdiction is working with your staff and their willingness to answer the phone and, and actually work with you to get through problems. Um, so that's already wonderful. But if, if there is something in the TOD that does give you an ability to not, not jump the line, at, but at least have an understanding that you will have a project approvable, um, I think that's a, that's a huge incentive for anybody. Um, and then the other concept, which I know kind of cuts against the grain of having affordable housing, but maybe if there can be some sort of um, cross use where you are able to, if there's two different projects, for example, and one maybe, you know, we were talking to Widener Apartments, who is looking at doing the whole waterfront for a long time, but um, has, is no longer, I, I don't think that plan is in place, but, you know, they didn't necessarily want affordable housing on the lakefront, but if that ever goes, to be able to transfer some of the affordable housing, you know, credits, use that in the TOD for other uh, market rate uh, projects. I like to have affordable mixed in with market rate. I think that's the goal. But if the ultimate goal is getting more development, maybe that's a flexibility that uh, you can kind of transfer those affordability credits uh, to, to one side or one, one area. Of Great. Okay, moving on to question seven, one more after this. Um, are there other factors besides regulations that affect TOD development that we should be aware of? Jenkins. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. All right, it looks like we've covered all the bases. Uh, for this last question, I am going to do a round robin quickly. Um, and the last question is, uh, the Planning Commission is considering expanding the uh, density uh, uh, allowances and the affordability requirements west to the downtown commercial area. The BRT will run along all of 522, so that also is an area close to transit. So uh, reactions, what should we be concerned about? Any issues? And I'll just go down the line alphabetically and start with Imad. Well, um, I think most jurisdictions start with a, um, a TOD uh, program in their downtown core. And I think that's, to me, it's a no brainer. It does need to be, uh, you're talking about minimum maximum density standards. Yes, however, the maximum density standards should be um, uh, uh, re reconsidered the way we've been talking about them all evening. Maybe there's FARs or that relate to the height uh, or or other other criteria instead of just a, an actual maximum density standard. So let's think about them 
if we're going to bring them into the downtown, think about it in a new way um, that is not included in the zoning at this time. Okay. Come on. Can you guys hear me? Uh-huh. Okay, great. Um, sorry for, for the tech issues. Um, yeah, I mean, as far as, as, as far as expanding towards other parts of the Kenmore region, I, I don't have any issues. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a question of like the previous question, which is the, what are the factors that are, that are making development be more incentivized? And I think it's always in the form of having the right uh, things that you guys are already doing, which is investing in the infrastructure that allows for development to be um, more ready um, and, and developers won't have to uh, come out of pocket to pay some some of the offsite costs that that happens and in, in things like sidewalks and things like that so whatever the the city can apply in that in that form will always be great and also developers being being um, scalable and having the ability to to apply to finance um, mechanisms such such as tech tax credits uh, and funds that can um, be geared towards affordable housing. So that that's always gonna be important to keep track of. So that's it. Jenkins? Yeah, I don't think I necessarily have any concerns with, with stretching it downtown. Uh, I will say, I don't know if there's been a, a chance to say, it, but I do, I am a huge proponent of making the, the TOD overlay a requirement rather than just an option because I don't, I think the, the option hasn't worked. Uh, nobody's taken it up. So maybe in conjunction, if the planning commission and the city council is considering making it a requirement in the current overlay zone, then maybe the option then gets pushed over uh, westward uh, as kind of a transition uh, at the same time. Okay. Alan? I, yes, it certainly expands, you know, the opportunities for affordable housing. And, but I think that, you know, the, the, one of the scoring criteria for affordable housing or, you know, 100% affordable housing is, is distance to high capacity transit and going any more than, I'd say, a half a mile from from the park and ride, um, you know, I, I think that would be the limit as far, you know, as as far as how far west you would go. Sarah. Yeah, so I will say I like Juan, I did want to just touch for one second on the question we didn't respond to because I was not apparently fast enough, but um, and then I will get back to that. But. <laughs> Um, I would just say, like Juan said, other factors besides regulations is just financing, I think, like available to find, like there's, there, there are a bunch of different amenities and improvements um, in addition to affordable housing subsidies that are really also, you know, limited and, and overprescribed. So in addition to need more subsidy for affordable housing, I also think if you're thinking about um, the, you know, the challenge of taking um, a place like Kenmore that has definitely, at least historically, a more suburban grid and trying to break that up and make it more walkable. There's just, there's a lot of, um, a lot of infrastructure that needs to go down and that's expensive. And, and the way the code is written right now, um, you know, that, that cost is largely borne on the developer. I'm curious, you know, if, if there is, um, if there are grant funds available, which often, you know, things like this come up and they're available for cities or counties to apply for, um, you know, something like uh, a matching program, which you might already have in some form, but like something that would basically incent or lessen the burden for some of the really important uh, infrastructure improvements that are also um, a really important piece of making Kenmore more transit oriented, but also costly. Um, and our costs that are currently borne by developers, I think that would really help too. Uh, but getting back to whether I'm worried about it expanding to downtown, I'm not worried about it. I do, what I like about having a really targeted overlay zone is it's a very, Kenmore's intention is very clear. So as you expand where this overlay or this required um, zoning goes into downtown, that makes a lot of sense. It just dilutes maybe a little bit um, where the city is trying to focus development. But 
do I have a problem with more development that is in the form of the TOD? Absolutely not. So. And Kevin. Yeah, I would say I, I'm in agreement with everybody on the panel that we don't see an issue um, expanding the minimum maximum densities towards the downtown area. I would just say, you know, I would look at kind of the issues that have been brought up today as far as the, the design standards and making sure that any issues, if you do really want higher density development in that downtown area that you take into account, uh, making sure that the standards kind of incentivize that and, and make that feasible. Okay, great. Well, we got through all of the eight questions. Great information. Thank you all so much. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Chair Thompson uh, in case the Planning Commission has follow-up questions. Well, thank so, you very much. Is, is there uh, any questions from the members? I think we're all mesmerized. <laughs> all it was so much information. <laughs> I've got many pages of notes. Tracy, you got your hand up first. Um, I'm curious about when you talk about incentivizing developers, like what, and, and, and talking about projects not being uh, worthwhile without proper incentives. What, 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 I'll just, I'll just be very direct. Like, what is the profit that a developer wants to make in order to make a development worthwhile for them to do? Just curious. Just speak up, folks. And everybody's laughing. I don't know why. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think every I think every developer uh, is Jenkins speaking. I think every developer has kind of their own metrics um, and their own kind of stakeholders that have their own requirements, right? Some developers need their money. You know, some investors need their money returned as soon as possible. Some developers for apartment buildings want to want to build and get out of there, you know, sell it to the to the next REIT or whatever that comes along. Um, other developers want to want to build and maintain and hold it, and it's a long term investment. And so. Um, there's not a single, um, I know all developers are kind of clumped into one, but there really isn't a single metric of, um, if this is the cost, this will work for me because everybody's got a very different um, kind of strategy or, or game plan in place for their, for their uh, business. Is that, is that too political of an answer? Is it, <laughs> I know it's kind of vague, but. Um, it's, it's the truth of it. Like Sioux Development, we build and, and own and operate. We have our own property management. That's what we do here at Sioux Development. I know other developers that literally will build it and don't care what it's going to operate like, just they want to sell it, right? So it just totally depends. Are there any more comments for Tracy's question? I, I was just going to say, and I'm obviously not a developer, so other folks on this panel are better suited for this question. But I would just say that... Um, Kenmore is like a really interesting, lovely, attractive city that has a lot of amenity. But in general, when you're thinking about trying to incent developers into Kenmore to do work, probably they're looking not just at Kenmore, but at surrounding communities as well and trying to figure out where, you know, where they can best locate to get projects that, you know, are going to be both not so terrible to develop that it's going to take forever and there's not going to be a lot of extra complexity that's going to you know introduce more risk but also you know Bothell is also a very interesting uh, interesting city that has a lot of similar amenity and transit um, you know there are a lot of little communities that are um, or smaller cities that are around Kenmore that that have you know a fair amount of amenity too and so I think it's more it's sort of a competitive thing if you know if, if you're looking just at Kenmore Maybe that's one thing, and you're talking about how much profit a developer needs to make. But if if a developer is looking to locate on the north side of Lake Washington, they might be looking at Kenmore and Bothell and Woodenville, and just trying to figure out you know where there's available profit, uh, property, what kind of amenity is around that property, and how difficult will it be to develop, and what kind of resources are available. And then that's <laughs> that's. Um, that's what that's what we have. You know, that's that's the kind of thing that's going on. So, I, I, it's a little bit more nuanced, I think. But. 
Are, are, is there any more questions from the council commission? Emma, did you have a response to my question? Or is, were you going to say yeah. something? Yes, yes, please. I mean, the old adage, time is money. The faster a developer can get the project done, the more cost effective it's going to be. That's, you know, that's pretty basic. Um, that's why I mentioned the expedited review process or whatever you can do to incentivize that. Another one is, you know, they want to maximize their land cost. They buy a property for a certain amount of dollars, say per unit, and they want to achieve those units or even greater. So that's, you know, that's, a, that's a component. Um, they want to build more for less, obviously that's the, the name of the game, um, but still have a beautiful project, one that's attractive has um, lots of natural light, high ceilings, all those things are still important, but they wanna build more for less. And then the demographic, we always use property managers to give us the right mix um, of units because uh, they, they deal with um, their, their projects that they manage all the time. So the right mix is important to them um, and the size of the units is important to them. So all those, I think those four factors are, are important to developers. Thank you, Iman. Any last, uh, Derek, go ahead. Yeah, I, I wanted to thank uh, the panel for their insight into the parking issues, um, particularly as a resident of Kenmore, well, I have to walk a mile and a half just to get to a bus um, route where I'm at. And for the TOD, so they're gonna be on a bus route. My concern is, what are they easily able to get to that they want or need in their daily routine or their lifestyle? For instance, a movie theater. Where's the closest movie theater they can get to on a bus route? Hey, we're gonna open up affordable housing on the TOD. What are they gonna be able to do living there? What kind of quality of life are we offering easily to make them not need a car or to help them not need a car if that's what we're trying to encourage and eliminate parking i i appreciate you kind of raising a flag saying it's not entirely reasonable to expect them to be without cars at this point in time the way that kenmore is set up so i just i really appreciate that and one of the questions that popped into my head was when you're talking about height restrictions is it, and it sounds like it might be more feasible for you to include parking if you're able to go up. I think the water table is a very reasonable concern um, in that area. And by raising height limit restrictions, does that allow you to offer more parking more, uh, more reasonably? Any one like to comment on that I'd, yeah I'd, I'd like to comment right. on the um the parking reduction um the, the the raising the building and allowing more parking um that's not something that we would try to do we would try to add more units if you can raise the building because the goal is to add units for affordable housing but one of the so there's basically every year there's about $200 million in bonds that are allocated for affordable housing. And it's, it's very competitive to get those bonds. And most of the projects, in fact, I, I think all of the projects in King County in the metro area are awarded the bonds where, where the projects are basically within a quarter mile of a lot of services, a quarter mile from grocery store and from other services in walking distance. And that's, that's to ensure that whoever lives there, if they don't have a car, if they can't afford to have a car, they can easily get to the bank or the grocery store or the doctor or something um, by walking. And so that's, that's, that's kind of the, one of the primary criteria in, in determining who gets awarded um, those bond funds to develop affordable housing. Is, is just distance to services and distance to transit. Transit is a, is a big part of that. Uh, Trace, um, Tracy? 
Oh no, did I, Jenkins? I think did Jenkins have a yeah, yeah, yeah just a, a, quick, yeah, a yeah, quick response to Derek. I think the question, you know, if you can go up to get more parking, and you know, Alan kind of referenced the, you know, not trying to fit in more parking, but I think as a general rule is when you go down uh, below grade, that's where the risk, you know, rises exponentially. Uh, regardless if the water table is high or not, anytime you excavate down, um, it gets risky and more expensive, especially when we only have what five months of good weather in Seattle, right? So, um, so that's um, that's what opens up the cost. Is anytime you go one level below grade, two levels now you're P four, you know P three, P four, you're really opening yourself up to a lot of uh, unnecessary risk and exposure. So, one, yeah, just piggybacking of what, what I've heard here, but it's interesting that there, on the one hand, there's the high water level, uh, high water level that precludes maybe underground parking. On the other hand, there's beautiful um, uh, natural feature that the, that the city has in their hands and the opportunity to, to create things like uh, interpretive walk pathways in there and, and and figure out what to do with the not quote unquote non developable developable traditionally uh, areas and then and and then how does everything tie to the Burke Gilman, which is a huge amenity for not just you and and the city of Kenmore but the entire region as a whole. So uh, those opportunities and the new and the new high capacity transit uh, together will definitely make it. Um, very important location, and I think the location is is right there, uh, as as any TOD would be. Uh, so in in that competitive environment, but I think having having the the right investments at the right time um, with the right amenities and and infrastructure that it needs uh, is kind of the key to success here. And I think it's it's going to be great to look at in the future as it, as it evolves. Well, I'm glad you brought up the Burke Gilman Trail. We're thinking of renaming it to the Brewery Row. Um, that we had, yes, we have a commissioner that's, that's brought that up already. Okay, Tracy, I, you're up again. So this is a follow-up question to Derek's. So I'm, I, I believe I heard during the discussion that having commercial spaces be a requirement of development can be a disincentive and a risk. And I'm also hearing that, and, and I know kind of experientially to be true, that we want people to be able to walk to amenities. And so I am wondering in your experience, how you fit those two pieces together and how we can, uh, you know, do urban planning such that we do have amenities near where people living are living if they're not necessarily included in the same structure? Well, there are a bunch of different ways you can start to get at that. Um, you know, there are, sorry, there are ways, um, there are ways to basically look at, you know, building ground floor that, that's convertible, right? Because it's the appropriate height for retail. Um, I mean, there are a bunch of different ways you could potentially do that. You could also, um, you know, you could take it, you could take the, most frequently what ends up happening in other codes that I've seen is that it's, it's, um, it's optional or, but the requirement is that the construction would allow conversion. Right, and um, uh, that is an expensive way to build. So it's not, it's not, you know, the most economical, but it certainly does allow for flexibility. The other thing that can be done is to, you know, require active ground floor uses that are engaging to folks that are walking by, but are not necessarily a commercial requirement. So, in places where there is not a super strong commercial market, but there's a requirement for active ground floor uses, there are lots of um, you know, there are lots of uses in multifamily housing projects, for example, that are like the community gathering spaces and things like that, that can be down on the ground floor um, that provide some activation in the same way that commercial would. But, um, you know, I, there also, you know, there are opportunities potentially to work with your economic development department and sort of 
uh, you know, find, make it so that it's not speculative development, right? Because that's what's really tricky too. So, Thank you. Just a, a couple ideas. Any further comments? Any further questions from the uh, commissioners? Mario? Thank you. And thank you all for spending that good Tuesday evening with us. Uh, really appreciate it. And, and Sarah, you don't need to apologize for your little run. She's a nice graph there, professional and toothless. Um, I did have a question, and this is from Juan and anyone else who would also like to uh, answer. But Juan, it was really intriguing what you were mentioning about the, the idea of shared parking access um, and uses, and that you mentioned some jurisdictions were doing that. Is that something that you're seeing? Um, either in our region or in our state, is this something that is uh, being seen outside of, of the Puget Sound area, essentially? Uh, because I'm thinking of like what type of incentives um, are needed to be put in place for that shared usage um, agreements. And I, I'm just trying to think of like what is the administrative yeah. um, pathway or even cost that would make it um, more difficult for folks to, to buy onto it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to be speaking necessarily um, to the details, but I, I can tell you that in places like Bothell and, and there's been spe specific partnerships that share parking and it's, it's just the shared parking agreement between two property owners and setting the times of when that shared parking, the whole, the whole theory behind that is that there are uses that are compatible because uh, for example, there might be a, a school parking that's only used during the day and then the weekends, another use like a hotel or something like that could take advantage of that. Um, so the, the, the notion is to share, to share the, 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 the excess demand that's, that's not being used with the, with the other partner. But it's essentially an agreement. Um, the agreement obviously can include a payment of whatever form, but um, that's up to the owners and, 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 and them to negotiate. But that's, that's kind of what, what would be there at stake. And if there, anybody can speak to other specific examples, that's, that's the intent behind that. Mod? Yes, <clears throat> the shared parking agreements are, are a, uh, as mentioned, are a private civil matter that have to be agreed on by two private parties to share their sites uh, across each other. <clears throat> However, the city zoning requirements um, need to, if that's the case, need to allow that and not have all on-site parking required for the project. So that's really the main thing that I think the city needs to focus on is allowing, allowing those to happen <clears throat> where you don't have to use everything on-site as your parking, uh, for your parking uh, total count. Derek? Yeah, I, I actually do have uh, experience with this and it works really well. Uh, we have a parking agreement. Uh, it's actually three way uh, at our location up in Mount Vernon where a cabinet shop occupies or uses the parking space Monday through Thursday, which is their hours of operation until 4 p.m. Um, and then the church across the street actually uses the parking on Sunday mornings until noon none of that interferes with our normal operating hours, which is primarily all off of those hours. Um, so it's a three-way, three different business owners, two different property owners, and the city just required something in writing that kind of broke down who's using the lot during what hours, and we had to show our hours of operation that the bulk of that business didn't, um, didn't overlap. And it works great. We've been doing it for three years. It's been fantastic. Okay. Are there any more questions from the commission? Well, hearing none, I, uh, on behalf of the commission, thank you uh, very much for all your time and wisdom uh, and the answers that you gave us. That we, you gave us a lot to chew on and to uh, uh, think more about when we uh, chomp on these uh, policy issues before they go to the council. So please feel free if you have any further ideas to send an email to 
uh, Lori or Debbie and they'll get it to us uh, without any uh, problem at all. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. So, okay, thank you. Thank you for having us. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks. I too would like to say thank you very much right. for your participation from the staff perspective. Bye-bye. So uh, <clears throat> could I ask Lori <clears throat> to just fill us in what you expect out of us on March 1st? So actually on March 1st, what I anticipate is that we would spend uh, a little bit of time doing a debriefing on tonight's wonderful presentation. And then also uh, we'll be looking at the housing land use element and capital facilities element background information. So we'll, once we have this conversation, then we're in uh, the position to uh, talk about amendments to the uh, TOD, but I think um, we'll not be in a position to bring those forward and probably until April at the earliest. Uh, but the next meeting will be a chance for you to let us know what you heard, the things you thought were most um, uh, critical, and then we'll go deeper into the conversation in a few meetings. Okay, so what you really want is some impressions that we yeah. have mm -hmm. of, right. our, of what we heard tonight. Right, or the things that really stood out to you so we'll know where we should focus. Of course. So is there anything for the good of the order? Hearing none, then uh, I uh, will adjourn this meeting for the Planning Commission on February, I believe it is February 15th, the day after Valentine's Day. I hope you all had a good Valentine's Day and look um, forward to seeing you on March 1st. Thank you very much for all your time and staff, great job tonight. Those were good questions, Derek. Sorry, just, just one last. Um, I just wanted to put out a thank you to Lori and Debbie uh, for the work I saw last night um, that went way into the wee hours. I think you guys were still working on this on the 15th uh, on the city meeting last night. So I don't know how much sleep you guys have had, but thank you very much for putting all this together. Okay. Mike, I, do you want to say something? Okay, uh, Nathan? I'll second that one. I actually hopped on the city council meeting like an hour or two into it. I didn't realize what I was getting in for and I stayed for the whole duration. So I, I saw all of that as well. So yeah, thank you for uh, last night. Thank you for tonight. And thank you for all of the work you put in for us. So it's wonderful. Happy to do it. Great. Okay, then we're done. See you in two weeks. Good night. Good night. Thank Good night. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.